Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship today, um, Mother's Day, um, May the 10th. Uh, happy Mother's Day to my mom. Hi, Mom. I love you. Miss you much. Can't wait to see you. Uh, but we thank the Lord for uh, the opportunity to, to give thanks to the Lord for um, the very great blessing of having a mom who loves the Lord. And if you're here today tuning in uh, and you're a mom, we thank you. Lord for you, and that you had the blessing of bringing children into the world. Uh, got a few announcements that we need to share with you, and then uh, we'll go to the Lord in prayer and uh, get started. Uh, first of all, um, good news, uh, Dot uh, had another negative test done, and so she'll be able to uh, spend time with, with her family uh, in just a few short days. So that's really great news uh, for Dot. Glad that Scott was able to teach this past Thursday evening. Uh, he will be teaching again this coming Thursday evening, 7 o'clock, live streaming right here. If you were not um, able to uh, watch it live stream last Thursday evening, it's now been posted on the church's website uh, along with uh, all the other sermons. It's just lumped in with all the other sermons that I give or anyone who ever speaks here. So that was posted yesterday, so you can get caught up on that. As sent out in an email, uh, the small groups are up and running again, and men's prayer as well, and we met yesterday, and that was a, uh, a really special time. Uh, next Sunday, Lord willing, uh, the 17th, uh, I've invited Ted Schneller will be here. We're going to worship the Lord at, at the Lord's table next Sunday, and uh, Roberto Arvela will be here as well. And I'm writing a, a worship service that, where we all can participate and, uh, and uh, so the Hispanic church also can tune in and uh, we'll go to the Lord's table together. And I look forward to that. Let's bow our heads in prayer and we'll get started in Romans 9. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day that you provided for us. You gave us rest last night and strength for this day. We thank you for all the provisions of another week. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to give our church and your church uh, wisdom and courage and endurance uh, during these days. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, uh, that you would um, move men and women's hearts who have authority over our lives, uh, that, that their hearts would be changed in such a way uh, that would benefit uh, our lives, uh, all of it. There is nothing more essential than worship. It is, it is the fabric of Scripture, of worshiping our God together. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, for good things to come for your church. Now, Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a mind to know what your Spirit has given to the Apostle Paul uh, here in your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you haven't turned there, go ahead, Romans chapter 9. Um, we are actually in the same section of Scripture that we were last week, but there is a, a couple things that's in, right there in verse 17 and 18 in chapter 9 that we did not get to. Uh, had to just really pass over it. So let me read verses 14 through 18 again. What shall we say then? How do we respond to this? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it, and that is election, as we learned from last week, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For, and here's our, real, here's our focus for today, because for... And Paul's now going to back it up with another quote from the Old Testament. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. And then Paul draws an inference from that and then says this, So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens. And there's the first time that Paul's used the word harden. Uh, in his letter to the Romans, and he hardens whomever he wills. So we need to be reminded again 
Uh, Paul has been proving to the Roman and Jewish believers that God's word has not failed. That takes us back to verse 6. And his basis is that there are individual Jews and Gentiles who make up the true spiritual Israel. That is to say, real individual Jews, like the Apostle Paul, and Gentiles, like the recipients of this letter, uh, who are saved in Christ. God never intended uh, to make Abraham the spiritual father of every single Jew in his family, but rather Jews and Gentiles of many nations. And what determines whether or not you are a child of promise, as we've learned from a couple sermons ago, instead of a child of flesh, is God's will not men's. But Paul has spent enough time with believers teaching them these truths that he's aware. He's aware of the objections and the protests that are often lodged against his teaching, drawing false conclusions. Paul anticipates, I think, he anticipates that if you get what he's saying here, that you might feel tempted to say that God is unjust, which is the point of verse 14. And so last week we raised uh, the main issue is why is God just in electing according to his own will? And that was our focus, which is just to be reminded, verse 15, when he says for, in verse 15, for, he says to Moses, and then he quotes Exodus chapter 33. Remember from last week, this was Moses on the mountain, and he asked God, show me your glory. And the first thing that God did was say this, I will have Compassion, I will have mercy upon whomever I will. That's his glory. That's, that's who God is in his character. And remembering from last week, that's the same Hebrew construction in chapter 3 of Exodus where God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and tell him, I am sent you. I am that I am. Meaning, if you ask God, who are you? God would say, who I am. God's own identity is not determined by anything outside of him. He is free from all external realities that would have a bearing upon his character and personhood. And likewise, if you were to ask God, who do you show mercy and compassion to? He would respond, whom I will. Again, nothing outside of God determines who he shows mercy to. And this freedom to show mercy to whomever he chooses is what it means to be God. It's an expression of his name, his reputation. It's his glory. So then, verse 16, it, his election, is not dependent upon anyone else outside of him. And therefore, we should say with glad hearts, as we did last week, therefore, God is just. We would not say, verse 14, that God is unjust, that there is injustice with him. He is just in all that he does. We agree with Abraham, may the, God of, may the judge of all the earth do what is just, and he will. So that's a, that's a recap of last week. Uh, so now, this week, uh, today, verses 17 and 18. And there's the first time that Paul uses the word harden. Uh, we need some help in understanding what Paul means to say and what he doesn't mean to say when he uses the word harden. It sounds like uh, that God is actively making people sinful and making them sinners because he's hardening their hearts. We would agree with other portions of Scripture that everyone deserves to be hardened, meaning, and I'm going to show this, meaning everyone deserves a judicial locking up of their heart. Remember Romans 1, and God gave them over, and he gave them up, and he gave them up. That is a judicial hardening, a judicial response to the sin that's already in my heart. Romans chapter 11 helps us understand a little bit more what this word means and how it's used. So let's turn to Romans 11. It's the next time that Paul uses the word. So we'll, we'll get there eventually, but let's turn to Romans 11. Look at verses 7 through 10. After Paul talks about verse 5, election chosen by grace, what then? Israel failed to obtain, verse 7, Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. And now Paul's going to quote from Isaiah chapter 29. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day, which was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 6 when God told Isaiah, go speak the truth, go speak the gospel to these people. 
they will not have ears to hear or eyes to see or a mind to know. And then Isaiah responds, well, how long am I going to speak to people who don't get it and don't want to get it? And God responds, until I have completely destroyed this city, Israel, by bringing in outside nations. So Paul quotes that, and that helps us understand what hardening is. It is God's judicial response to sinful sinners. God is not making sinful sinners. He's responding to them. He's locking their heart up. And then the Apostle Paul, verse 9, quotes from David, Psalm chapter Psalm 69, which is a prayer. It's actually a prayer or a song of judgment. And so David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. And then one more time, down in verse 25, Paul will use the word hardened again. Look at verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. When we get to that verse, I'm going to lay it out, and I believe what this is teaching is that, is that the partial hardening has to do with real Jews, ethnic Israel. I believe this is referring to ethnic Israel. Are there Jews coming to know the Lord today? Yes. But by and large, no. They are still in full rejection. One day I believe God is going to lift the veil off of their eyes and uh, take away the hardening. So, Exodus is an incredible book to look at. And so, for the rest of our time this morning, we're going to be in Exodus. So, join me. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 4. I want us to see how Paul is using this truth that he quotes uh, here in chapter 9, uh, quoting from Exodus regarding Pharaoh. So we need to go back and look and see what the fuller argument really is. So Exodus chapter 4, we'll pick it up there. Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. Exodus 4, verse 21. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that, you, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. The Lord is going to harden his heart. Chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 clarifies a little bit more. Chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, of God of, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Now notice what Pharaoh is not saying here. Pharaoh is not saying, You know, I'd love to let the people go, but God hardened my heart. No, Pharaoh does not want to let the people go. He is totally unaware. He thinks he's in total control. He is totally unaware of anything outside of his own ambitions and his own desires. He does not realize that God is hardening his heart. He does not understand that God is actually giving his own sinful heart up to itself, locking his heart up to the cravings of his sinful desires. He feels no constraint from the Lord at all. Chapter 5, verse 7 through 9. He says, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, Let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So Pharaoh makes it unbearable for the Hebrew children. He's a tyrant and he wants to make their lives miserable. He's jealous for supremacy uh, over uh, human beings. We need to be reminded of a great quote from R.C. Sproul at this point. God is not creating fresh evil 
in Pharaoh's heart. But God is sovereign over it. It's already there. And God has a purpose. God is punishing the heart of Pharaoh by chaining the heart to itself. And therefore the heart will get harder and harder and harder against truth and righteousness. If we could just pause just for a minute and think about that for our own hearts. That could have been my fate. That could have been yours. And it would have been just. It would have been just. We would be walking in darkness right now, absolutely despising everything that this book represents and despising our Lord. What mercy, what mercy. He set us free. Chapter 5, verse 22 says, Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. That's, that's pretty bold language for Moses to use uh, in front of the Lord. And the Lord is, uh, he responds in an incredible way. But I need to clarify something. The evil here, this Hebrew word, it's used in the same way it's found in several places in the Old Testament. Uh, like Amos chapter 3, verse 2. If evil befalls a city, is it not the Lord who has done it? Sometimes evil means moral evil. But sometimes the word evil means a calamity, a disaster. And I think that's what is being referred to here, not a moral evil. It, it is, it, it's a horrific issue that has taken place here because Pharaoh has made the labor even harder. They still have to produce the same amount of bricks, uh, but they have to go gather their straw, and they'll be punished if they don't make the certain amount of bricks. And this is, this is a great hardship, great hardship. This is what tyrants do. They make it hard on people's lives. But ultimately, look what Moses is doing here. For since I came to favor to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Moses knows ultimately why Pharaoh is just getting meaner and meaner. It's because the Lord. Moses sees this. We see it in society today. Wonder what kind of things the Lord is doing that's actually turning out to place hardship in our lives because God is hardening the hearts of men. Look how the Lord responds to this. Chapter 6, um, verse 1. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. So we're, we're, we're getting closer and closer to understanding the purpose, the purpose of why God hardened Pharaoh's heart. We're not there yet. It's not even being revealed, but uh, it's, it's coming. Then we go to chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Chapter 7, 1 through 5. And here we have it. Uh, the purpose is about to emerge. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. Like God. Not a God, but so Elohim is, is often used like this in Scripture. Because Moses is actually standing, and he's speaking the words of the Lord, and he's doing things that, that only the Lord can do, these miracles and these plagues. See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. <laughs> Go do this, but they're not going to obey. He's not going to obey. Verse 4, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my host, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. See, it's judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. So here we're getting a hint of, of the purpose. It's, it's the reputation of who God is. And then the, all of Egypt will know who I am. That I'm mightier than Pharaoh. The reason why God hardens is so that he might deliver his people in such a way that when it happens, 
people see that the Lord is mightier than man. The Lord is mightier than man. Look at chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 13. Chapter 9, verse 13. I'm going to read all the way down through. This is the seventh plague. I'm going to read verses 13 through 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. See, there it is. Here's the purpose. It's the reputation of who God is. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. It was mercy that, that Pharaoh uh, and the Egyptians were even still alive. But for this purpose, there we go, and here it is. But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. We'll come back to that. Let's keep on reading. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow I will cause very heavy hail to fall such as never has been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now therefore send, get your livestock and all that you have in the field into safe shelter. For every man and beast that is in the field and is not brought home will die when the hail falls on them. Then whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of the Lord left his slaves and his livestock in the field, and they died. And this is even mercy. God is warning them. I'm going to send a hailstorm that if you're outside, you're going to get killed. It's going to be that bad. And that, even that forewarning was mercy. And Pharaoh is still... Uh, stubborn and hard-hearted. So God instructs Moses how to prepare for the seventh plague. Now, there in verse 16 is where Paul gets the quote in Romans 9, 17. Let's look at Exodus 9, 16 again. That's Paul's quote. Verse 16, but for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. And that's an amazing thing that God is doing here. God is going to get the gospel out and the reputation will precede even the gospel preachers. What? Because this story is now in God's word. And now the whole world knows this, that God raised Pharaoh up just to crush him. God raises men up and in their stubborn rebellion for one purpose, that God's name would be known. He's mightier. He's mightier. And God is still doing that. In Romans 9.17 is this quote. And the inference that Paul draws from that quote is, what's verse 18? Romans 9.18. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. The verse that Paul chooses to quote here in Exodus chapter 9, verse 16, doesn't even contain the word harden. There's, Paul could have quoted lots of verses here in Exodus that used the actual word hardened Pharaoh's heart to show that God hardens whom he wills. Why didn't Paul use a verse in Exodus that uses the word harden? He didn't. The reason why is because the issue is not simply hardening one person and showing mercy to another. Paul quotes Exodus 9.16 because he wants to show the purpose of God's actions. The aim and goal of why, why God does what he does. And that purpose is to demonstrate, now we're at the title of our sermon today, God's freedom to show mercy or to harden and that purpose is to demonstrate God's sovereign freedom and who receives mercy and who is hardened. Both mercy and hardening are grounded in God's will and not in men's willing or their running or their attitudes or their actions. This is what it means for God to be God. He is the all-glorious God whose very nature and actions are not determined by anything outside of him, but by his own perfect will and wonderful purposes. Now, 
I've had discussions with people in the past who disagreed with what I'm teaching here in Romans 9, and one of the ways that they try to get around unconditional election and what's happening here is just to simply say that the only thing that's happening in Romans 9 is that God is only concerned with historical affairs of ethnic groups. The historical affairs of ethnic groups. Raising one king up for this purpose and casting down another king for another purpose. I completely disagree with that, and here's the reason why. Why would God choose the words mercy and harden at all if that were true? I mean, if that were true, if it's just about one class of people getting an advantage in this life over another class of people, after quoting Moses, Paul should have said something like this. I have raised you up for this purpose. Therefore, he raises up whom he will. Paul doesn't say, therefore, he raises up whom he will. He says, therefore, he hardens. He has mercy on whomever he wants to, and he hardens whoever he wants to. So it's not simply about one class of people getting an advantage in this, in this life over another. No, it's more, it is that. I would agree with that. But that's not Paul's argument. Paul is wanting to show and prove that God's word has not failed. Romans chapter 9, verse 6. And the way that he's proving that is that everything that God had planned to, to do, it's happened exactly as God planned it. Which explains why people are in rebellion against the Lord and why people love the Lord. Because God is sovereign over the heart. His word is doing exactly what it was intended to do. Paul uh, is not just showing God's control over historical roles of people groups. He has not lost sight of the theological crisis he wants to address, namely this, though it seems that God's word of promise has fallen and is ineffective because thousands of Jewish men and women are not saved, Paul is simply saying, I assure you, God's word of promise has not failed. God's purpose is right on track to show himself as the glorious God who is absolutely just and free to display his name by showing mercy on whomever he chooses and to harden whomever he chooses. When you read um, the Exodus story, uh, the entire story of leaving Egypt, which starts in chapter 4 and goes all the way through chapter 14, not once, not a single time, is God's hardening of Pharaoh's heart grounded in anything other than God's purpose to demonstrate his own power and to magnify his name. There's not a single act or an attitude on Pharaoh's part that is the basis of God's actions. It's got nothing to do with Pharaoh's actions. The action of God in Pharaoh's life is determined ultimately by the purpose of God, not Pharaoh's. And that purpose is to demonstrate that the effectiveness of God's word is not determined by men's responses or non-responses. Let me say that again. That purpose is to demonstrate that the effectiveness of God's word is not determined by men's responses or non-responses. And therefore, it is not that the word of God has no effect. God is fulfilling his word exactly as he has planned. Exactly. And the proof is, God is telling Moses, but I will harden his heart and he won't let, let him go. That's God's word. And God's word is taking place. It's, it's happening exactly as he says it. Look at, if you're still in Exodus, I hope you're still there. Look at Exodus chapter 9, verse 29. Exodus 9, 29. Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. Again, it's all about so that you may know who this God is. He controls everything. He controls tsunamis. He controls the weather patterns. All of it. Exactly as God has determined. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. You don't fear him. Verse 34 says, But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart. It's the only time it's mentioned that he, where it says he, he hardened his own heart. 
he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Have you ever wondered that, um, I have, especially with my own family members, uh, a, a tragedy takes place uh, in the family, and then we say, surely this will wake them up. Uh, I remember the first time that I heard that. Uh, it was 1971 uh, when one of my oldest cousins was killed, killed in a car wreck. He was doing drugs and he was drunk. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a school day. They crossed center line and, and Terry was, was killed. Uh, they hit a school bus head on. I remember at the funeral downtown Clay, West Virginia. I remember hearing one of my aunts say, Shirley, this is going to wake up the other boys. Because Terry was one of seven boys by Aunt Sharon. Ricky went on to keep doing drugs. Joey went on to keep doing drugs. Incarceration. And most of my cousins are dead now. There's only a few alive. Out of those seven boys, there's three. You know, Pharaoh was seeing the mercy of God. The hail stopped. Men's hearts are so sinful that even when God is merciful, they still won't give him thanks. That's how bad our hearts, that's, that's, the, that's how bad the condition of our hearts are, are in. And But for the mercy of God, the heart will stay stubborn. So what is your greatest hope for the, your lost neighbor, your lost friend, your lost coworker that you care deeply about? Is your hope in their willpower? Or is your hope in that God will be merciful to their heart? God must show mercy. Chapter 10, verses 1 and 2 of Exodus. Chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. In days to come, telling stories of how God dealt harshly with wicked people. Yeah. Yeah. In days to come, telling our children and grandchildren. Let me tell you a story how God dealt harshly with wicked people. Because that is who he is. He is a just and holy God. And if we think that wicked people are going to escape the wrath of God, they're not. They're not. Not today, not ever. By the time all the plagues are done... Chapter 14, if you turn there with me. Chapter 14. The plagues are over. The Israelites have been released. Uh, but the purpose of God's hardening of Pharaoh is not yet complete. It's, it's, not, it's not there yet. It's getting close. Look at chapter 14. Just three th verses 3 through 5. For Pharaoh will save the people of Israel. They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Verse 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, What is this we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And then they mounted their chariots, and they took off after them, and cornered them at the Red Sea. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel, while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. Look at verse 17 and 18. 17. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Look at verse 31. Verse 31. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. 
And we just skipped over the section where the Lord drowned Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea while the children of Israel escaped on dry land. So, this is God's aim. To demonstrate his power and glory so that his name will be declared in all the earth so that the gospel goes out. In chapter 15, verse 1, here's what we don't see. Moses does not call and hold a Bible conference and title the conference um, something like um, um, Perplexing Issues of Divine Sovereignty and Human Responsibility. No. You know what they do? They sing. They sing. They worship. Chapter 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The flood stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard. They tremble. Pangs have ceased seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. He reigns. The Lord reigns. He reigns over cancer. He reigns over marriages. He reigns over your children. He reigns over your plans and your dreams. He reigns all over your, all of your pains and your pleasures. He reigns over the government. Praise the Lord. He reigns over the souls of men. Verse 19, for when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand. And all the women went out, with their, went, went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Listen, the sovereignty of God is a reason to sing and worship and have hope and take courage and trust and pray and rest in the God who is not bound by men's actions or attitudes, period. He's not. So what's this all about? I have one more passage of Scripture to show you. Turn to Revelation chapter 15. And this takes us back to some wonderful, wonderful times and Sundays when we were working through the book of Revelation verse by verse. After this section, chapter 14, coming to the end of the tribulation, which I believe uh, we're in it right now. I didn't plan to say this, but I think I will. 
I'm starting to feel sorry for my, um, my brothers and sisters in Christ who may be starting to scratch their head and wonder if, where is that pre-trib rapture? I mean, this is not supposed to be going on. The church is not supposed to be enduring this. We should have been out of here by now. You see, chapter 14, if you remember those days when we were in Revelation, I believe the seals, trumpets, and bowls are giving us the same identical picture, just telling us the same story from a different angle. And we've gotten to this point, if you remember those days, the crescendo has taken place, and there were peals of thunder and blasts of lightning, and there, there was a great earthquake. It's over, and the wrath of God is poured out upon the earth, and God's people are safely home. In chapter 15, the conclusion again, here it comes, the refrain. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands, and they sing the song of Moses that we just sang. Exodus 15, Revelation 15. The servant of God and the song of the Lamb. But now it's not just the song of Moses, it's the song of the Lamb. That's the newness of the song that we are going to sing when this is all over with. When the wrath of God is being, as it's being poured out right now, Romans chapter 1, it's coming down. And it's coming down harder. And God is hardening men's hearts. It's happening. So where is this all headed? To worship the God of all the earth, when God one day shows the entire world who is the true Lord of lords and King of kings, and no longer just the song of Moses, but the song of the Lamb, Christ will rule and reign, and everyone will tremble when he comes on the clouds. This is the purpose of God. God wants to be known for who he is, and he's going to make himself known. And then quoting Exodus 15, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. So what's this all about? I raise up men and I harden their hearts. Why does God do things like that? to show mercy upon whomever he wills. That is who he is, and to harden whomever he wills. Hey, folks, I read the book of Revelation. It's going to get harder than it is now. It's going to get harder than it is now. What's God doing? He's preparing for a day of worship unlike the world has ever seen. And we will sing when we cross over on dry land. And we will see the purposes of the Lord. And he will reign. And we will reign with him. So let us lift up our eyes. Let us remember that our God is in control. He is doing things on a grand scale that the world has not seen anything like it yet. And he will win. He will win. And we'll reign with him. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, like the old song goes in my prayer now as I close tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know thus saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him o'er and o'er Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more and we say amen Amen. Have a great day.